Welcome to Kingdom Culture Ministries. I am Pastor Ken Howard, and we are honored and excited you're here today. And if you are new here today, our ushers will get you a card in your hand. Just love for you to fill it out. At least give your name and your number and an email address, and we'd love to reach back out to you to check in and see how things are going. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And we'll get started today. So thank you, Andre and, and Judith. They had to leave um, to attend to another engagement, but we are certainly honored that they are a part of our praise and worship team. And, and my nephew, William, give a hand clap for William. For Michael, <laughs> I'm getting old. But keeping the drum, I tell you, the drums are important. Drums are connected to the heartbeat. And when he plays those drums, he's always had a sense he's a little boy. That anointing kicks on him and, and the atmosphere will change. It's amazing what the drums will do and what you're going through. But it's like it's, it's like the heartbeat. And the more repetitive it gets, the more the, a, a different cadence hits. It's a different realm in the spirit that we're hitting. So I appreciate my nephew for being obedient and, and sending us in and ushering in. Amen for that as well. All right. So I said, let me get right into this. Um, last Sunday, without a doubt, was one of the most important days and dates in the Christian calendar. We celebrated Easter and it was Resurrection Day. Amen. And we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, his, his, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, how he conquered death and redeemed us from sin. And it's a glorious message. It is something that we need to speak more of it. And, and beyond all that, we, we celebrated that. We, we had a good time. We had fun and fellowship and food. We had our KCM kids that uh, gave us a, a great rendition about the 12 eggs, uh, 12 eggs of Easter. We, we, we had some muffins and donuts and some juice. And we, we had a good time. We had an Easter egg hunt. We had a wonderful time, right? But this is where things are interesting. No less than 24 hours since that moment, we all had to, some fun last week. The next morning comes. D gets a call from a coworker of hers saying, hey, I'm in downtown Louisville and uh, um, I just heard something over the radio wire that, that a, a police officer got shot in the head and there's some mass shooting going on. We're like, no, really? So we begin to pray and think about it. And then next thing we know, the news starts hitting and then the news cycle kicks in. It's nothing more daunting than watching CNN or a national uh, Fox, whatever you watch. And then you see your community on TV yeah. in a bad way. And it was like, wow, what it was a, a, a just a. Again, less than 24 hours in our celebration of Easter and Resurrection Sunday and all the things that Jesus did, less than 24 hours in our own community, mass gun shooting. And the, the scary and the frightening thing is that's not the first mass shooting we've had in this community the last couple of years. And beyond that as well, you know, that, that, that shooting, obviously, we know that it left five people dead and eight others injured. It's horrific. And then less than two weeks, or about two weeks since that incident, there was another shooting in Nashville, our neighboring city, where I think how many, six people died there. Major gun control protests at the state capitol, all kind of calamities happening. Folks, there's been a lot of death and violence, not only in this community, but it's in this nation. And it's, it takes your heart away, your breath away. It, it's a hard thing to watch, seeing somebody murdered for no reason basically for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. But the thing is, we're seeing so many of these incidences that we're starting to get desensitized. Oh, there's another shooting. You know there's another shooting. In fact, just this, night, this, this last night um, in I think Dadeville, Alabama, there was another shooting. I think up to 20 people have been injured at a sweet 16 birthday party. It's... Um, <clears throat> We are living in some interesting and dire times, folks. And beyond all the shootings, did anybody see what's going on in, 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 in um, Fort Lauderdale and Miami and all the flooding that's happening? Anybody seen that? Massive flooding happening. The airport had to close down because there was so much water. Um, earthquakes are happening all over the world. Tornadoes, heck, we just had our uh, Newburgh touchdown in, in Dixie Highway. The storms are getting more, things that used to happen every seven years it seem like they're happening every seven days. Are you paying attention to what's going on in our world? Yes. Yes. The earth is moaning and groaning. These are dire times. And it makes me think about the Bible talks about the last days. And for context, the last days are the days when Jesus Christ, again, was alive. He died. He ascended into heaven until the time he comes again are the last days. And I don't know about you, but it seems like we're getting nearer and nearer to those final days before he comes again. 
And if you read and you understand the revelation and scripture, you know that those prophecies are being fulfilled. Many of them right before our very eyes. Things are happening. Things are changing at a rapid rate. But the question is, how are you dealing with it? I can tell that it's weighing on you. This this life, this the shootings, this, that in itself will weigh on you as believers. It will weigh on anybody. If you see death constantly on TV and you see people that you uh, the, the, our governor said there was somebody who knew that got shot. They're, they're, the, the separation between what's happening on the news and what's happening in your life is getting less and less and less. That is getting closer, closer and it's getting closer and it's causing a feeling of fear. And I'm not even talking about the people in the world. I'm talking about the people in the church. People in the church are getting fearful. They're getting weary because of what's happening in their world and they feel like they can't control it. Has anybody ever asked or wondered, where is God? I think that question comes up quite often. People in and outside of the church, because it's easy to get down. It's easy to feel like the enemy's still winning. You turn on the TV and you see this calamity. It seems like the enemy is winning over and over again. That could be hard to swallow sometimes when you know that we serve a God that sits on high and looks low. But yet all this calamity is still happening anyways. Has anybody ever asked where is God? Nobody. I'm going to say it on this. Nobody's asked, where is God? God, where are you? Why do you let this happen? Has anybody ever said that? Uh-huh. People ask that quite frequently. Why did this have to happen? Why does good things happen or bad things happen to good people is the proverbial question. And again, it seems like the forces of evil are winning. It's like a tug of war. And it seems like they keep winning and they keep pulling and they keep killing and they keep destroying and they keep tearing people's lives apart. Addictions are on the rise. People are dying of addictions and things are getting laced and and people that think it under one concept and and they're they're getting killed and they're getting poisoned. God, it seems like the enemy is winning. It's a thought that we can carelessly invoke. And even as the earth continues to moan and these storms get more ferocious and more fierce, it's um, again, it's an interesting time we're living in. Hey, COVID. COVID, I mean, it, it seems like forever ago when that happened, but that was a tough time, wasn't it not? Hold in your house, scared to hug people, somebody cover, everybody's looking at them, oh, they got, they got the vids, they got the vid. <laughs> Remember that? Somebody come in without a mask, you're like, oh, 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 something's wrong with them. That wasn't that long ago. It was a horrific time. I was just thinking recently about my daughter, Kennedy. Kennedy couldn't have a prom or things that we take for granted or, or certain things because she couldn't go out at that time a couple years ago. These are, ter- these are interesting times. And this is what the backdrop for my message today. And I want to talk about the echoes of Easter. My message today is the echoes of Easter because the message of Easter, the message of the resurrection has still got to reverberate in your minds and your hearts. Because as the times get rougher, because this is the thing, where we are, this is not the end of it. In fact, according to my Bible, it's probably going to get worse. But you've got to have something to remind you of why you're here, remind you whose you are and whose you belong to. Because you're going to get tested watching the news. You're going to get tested, people in your circle, your friends, the, the things that are happening in their life. You're going to get tested. Where is God? In my message today, I want to give a definitive where he's at what he's up to in your position to those questions. So if we could, please, again, my message today is called Echoes of Easter. And we're going to base my message today off of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it's three simple verses that are powerful. Verses 55 through 58. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 58. This is my response when somebody says, where is God? And it simply says this, starting in verse 55. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. Somebody say, thank God. Thank God. But thank God. Again, anytime you see the word but, anything after it, it negates everything before it. But thank God. He gives us victory over sin and what? And death death through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. This has been the reading of the Lord. Someone say amen. amen. And I love this is one of Paul's letters to the, the church of Corinth. And he's Corinth, Corinth is another city very similar to America. There's a lot of hustling and bustling going on. People are moving and shaking. People are, are thinking about commerce and people are trying to advance in their careers and, and have a, a life that's full of fun and joy. And they're, they're overdoing it. This is the people in the church. And they're doing a little bit too much sometimes. They forget their training and their counseling. And they're, and they're thinking, what, how should we behave in the church? And Paul's writing this letter, letting them know the things they should do and the things they shouldn't do. But also he reminds them the victory they have in Jesus Christ. And I want to talk about some of these things about victory that we have, because it seems like the devil is lose, is winning many times. But never forget, Jesus has already won. Amen. This is not he's going to win. No, no, he's already won. So just like you see, the enemy seems like he's winning. It may, there's a lot of things that may seem that are not. And you've got to have the perspective that Jesus has already won. And because our connection with Jesus, we have also won as well. So let me talk about a couple of things in, the, in that scripture that should give you some perspective as the days and months come, as you hear more calamity on the news, as you hear about death and senseless shootings and all these things that happen, I need you to remind yourselves of these things. First being this, we have victory over the sting of death. Amen. Thank you for your overwhelming and underwhelming response. <laughs> I said we have victory over the sting of death. And I love how Paul says that. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? And it's almost like he's talking to death like death's a person. Because think about it. Most of us, when we're frightened, we're frightened about the fear of death. We're frightened about what happens if we do die. But Paul's saying, ah, nothing to fear because you got victory over that. Yeah, yeah. And he explains. <laughs> now, now let, me, let me clarify something. Paul's not saying if somebody in your circle dies that it does not hurt. He's not saying that. He's not saying that when we lose loved ones that we're not to be grieved or not to be mourned. He's not saying that. What he's saying is the sting of death is what a sin is. Amen. Sin is the sting of death. And as I said many times, there's nothing worse than going to a funeral with somebody you don't know if they're in heaven, if they are they're a believer or not. You have no idea where they're going. That is the worst feeling in the world. Going to a funeral, especially a loved one that you may know or distantly, but you don't know, are they... With Jesus, are they in that casting of their soul going into the ground? And Paul's saying, hey, there's no sting. Don't worry about death. We have victory over that. Because the word sting is a twofold meaning. Sting is a sharp pointed instrument that injects poison. Very similar to a bee sting or maybe a, uh, the tail of a, of a scorpion that strikes and it infuses poison. Because the thing about sin is many times the, the poison of sin is continuous. It's not immediate. It seeps into the body and it eventually it destroys it. Sin will ultimately lead to death. How many of us remember the story of Adam and Eve when Adam and Eve is in the garden and, and, and God told him what to do and what not to do? We talked about this last week. And then God says, if you do this thing, you will surely die. The devil says, ah, you're not going to die. Don't worry about it. Go ahead and do it. Just take a bite. What's one little bite going to hurt you? They take the bite, but they don't die immediately. And the thing is, you got to be careful. This is because you don't die a physical death. Doesn't mean you won't die a spiritual death. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Nothing worse than having a spiritual death from God. This body can go back into the ground. But if you're died dead spiritually to God, ooh, that's a whole nother level of fear you need to be aware of. And what Paul is saying is we don't have to worry about the sting of death because as believers, we have been accepted. We've been grafted into the kingdom of God. So therefore, we don't have the fate of just going in the ground and staying there. No, no, our bodies will go back to the ground where they were created, but we get to go back to heaven. Yes. Yes. To be absent of the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, yes. And no matter what you see on TV, and even if we die ourselves, this life is only a glimmer. Eternity is forever. Yes. If, if you're a believer. And there's a whole lot of people out there that are not believers. Their fates are very different than ours. That's why it's important for us to spread the gospel, because there's people in our circle right now that we know are not saved. And now 
It's not your responsibility to get them saved. It's your responsibility to tell them about the glory of getting saved and the joys of being saved. Let your light be your life be the light that shines to them that wants to get saved because of how your life is. But there's a lot of people that will not you will not see in paradise. And under the notion of stinging, again, like Adam and Eve, they, they didn't suffer a physical death. They eventually would, but not right, right then. And they had a spiritual death. And when we get saved, we are rescued from ultimate spiritual death. And even as believers, when we sin, because believers, we do sin. And when we don't repent, guess what sin turns into? It turns into a weariness. It turns into you being depressed. It turns into you worrying about your life. It turns into all the things that the world is inundated with. Folks, the problem with the church right now is most people can't tell us between the church and between the world. Because we react to issues the same way. If you're a believer, you have victory, you should act like it. You should have walk around with your head up saying, hey, I know it's a bad day, but I got a good life coming. But that's a perspective that you have won. Many of us feel like we're going through life that we're in the battle. No, no, you've already won the battle. God won that for us. Act like it. Nothing worse than showing up to a game. And you already know the outcome if you think you're going to lose. You don't play very hard. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, I'm going to pick on my youngest, Madison. Madison plays lacrosse. Madison's team is probably 0 and 10 this year. 0 means like zero wins and 10, 12 losses. It's been hard to watch them. And I had a pep talk with Madison on the way to the game yesterday. I said, hey, honey, listen, you, you're better than this. We, we, we got a plan, and this is what you need to do, and you, you got this. You got to have some heart. Because my thing, I was, I, to be honest with you, I was getting a little perturbed with her because when she would lose, she would not care about losing. I hate to lose. She just like loses. Like, oh, I'm about to go about my business. I'm like, girl, you have to have heart or something, right? Because I'm in the stands. Her mom and I, uh, D and I are in the stands. We like, we just spent all this time and this money. No, y'all better win something. You better win a cupcake or some water or something. You better win the coin toss. You better win something today. So anyways, Madison, have a little pep talk with her. Madison scores the first two goals. She's playing like a beast. The team is up, right? I'm like, oh, man, this might be the day. I told the parents, this might be the day, y'all. Hang on. (laughs) <laughs> so the game, they win the, uh, they're, they're leading the game. It's, it comes down to a tie. But they lose. Now, one bit of information. I'm going to tell you how bad the team is. This is no joke, and I promise you this. Before the game started, I was looking up in the sky. I promise you, there were five black buzzards circling around their team. I think they could smell death or something on the, on the game. I don't know. No joke. I said, man. Even the buzzards know (laughs) they can smell the death in the air. But they played hard, they played valiantly, but they end up losing by one goal. And and but they played with heart. They played like they wanted to win, and they almost did. And the thing about it is, I was okay with Madison because that's her father. I gave her some instruction. I'm okay that she lost that game, but she won in life because she knew not to quit. She knew that if I try hard, I can get my best. That's all I can do. She won that day in my eyes. Now, one thing I didn't tell you on the way in, I said, listen, honey, if y'all don't win it and you don't score no goals, you're going to be walking home. (laughs) I did tell her that. Might be bad parenting, but it did work. She did score three goals. You say what you want to say. She scored half the goals of that team. And even the parents at the end of the game said, okay, is is, is Madison going to be able to ride home today? I said, well, I think so. I think I'm going to take her home. And they laughed. It was a big joke. But the point being is, I was proud of her because she gave it all she got. That's all I asked her to do. And just like in life, God says, here's my word. Give it all you got. Trust me on my word. Trust my techniques. Trust the things that I'm telling you. And guess what? If you lose that game, it's okay because you played the game well. Because you've already won the tournament. You've already won the championship. That, that one game was just a moment in time in your life. I was glad she listened to her father. She had some success when she listened to her father. Now, whether the team didn't win, but she won in my eyes. She tried. I think God is asking the same thing. Trust me. And even though it may seem like calamity and the enemy is winning, trust me, because I know the strategy. And if you don't win like you think you should win, doesn't mean you didn't win in his eyes. We got to trust God. Amen. Amen. Because we are saved. 
I know many of you right now are scared to death from watching the news. Because every time you turn it on, there's some bad. How often do you watch the news and something good happens? Like so and so got a uh, got a won the lottery today and, they, and everything is wonderful. Um, most times when you watch the news, it's intentionally to be bad. That's how enter- they entertain you is with bad news. And the thing about it is we are so inundated with what's going on in the world that we forget what's going on in the church. We're so inundated with watching TV and watching the news and, and watching social media that we're spending less time reading the word. It's kind of like being in a boat in a storm. You're OK in that boat in that storm as long as the water on the outside doesn't get on the inside. That's when you sink. You can weary the tough winds and the, advers- the adversity of life as long as what's on the outside that you own don't come on the inside. And sometimes as Christians, we get so inundated with what's happening outwardly that it gets on the inside of us. The world's issues get on the inside of us and we forget the promises of God that we've already won. We've got to. I'm, listen, I'm telling you this because more stuff's going to happen. That's right. More bad things are going to happen in this world. You've got to be prepared. You've got to anchor down. You've got to know who is your keeper. Amen. It's not going to get better, y'all. Right. I hate to be the bearer of bad news if this is, not, if this is a news flash. This is how it's going to be. In fact, I just watched the news. They're talking about the, the U.S. currency may topple and that it may not be the dominant currency in the world. There's always going to be issues of rumors of wars and wars. But this thing is consistent and is stable. Keep it close. Read it. Trust me, more things are going to happen because things have got to be fulfilled. The earth is moaning. But this victory will stick by you forever. Amen. Amen. Romans 8 and 6 and 23 says this. Romans chapter 6, 20 says this. It says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The wages of sin is death. Death is caused by sin. So, again, the point I was making earlier is that many of us in the church, we're, we're, we sin. But if you don't repent, that sin weighs on you. It's a slow poison. You've got to repent. You've got to ask God to cleanse your heart now more than ever. Because there's more temptations coming at you than there's ever been in your lifetime. We get tempted by more things than our parents did and our grandparents did by social media and media. You're in and think about how much information comes to your mind every day. You've got to guard yourself. This will wash you clean. This is, this is like a filtration process. Anything that tries to get through this Bible will be filtered clean to you, like water. I've seen people that drink water out of a lake, but they've got a filtration system that will allow them to do that. Because if you don't and you take the water, it's contaminated. The information in the world is contaminated. And if you don't consult this Bible, if you don't read it, you will be contaminated as well. And you'll think things that are uh, d- demonic. I'm getting tired of people talking about crystals and and people talking about um, horoscopes. And it's people are searching for answers, but the answers are always here. Yes. Yes. And I'm hearing more and more people in the church consulting and doing things that are blasphemous. Get back to the word. Amen. Get back to what we know is true. And that's why we don't have to fear death. Because death no longer has power over us. Amen. You don't have to fear anything. If you want to fear something, again, fear death more than you need to fear God. Because if you're separated from God spiritually, as I said, there is no greater concern when you are separated from God's love. You're separated from his reach. This is the time to pray and anchor down. So we talked about the victory over death. Now I want to talk about the victory over over the grave. In verse 55, Paul says, Oh, grave, where is your victory? Where is thy victory? In Proverbs chapter 30, verses 15 and 16, it says, The grave is never satisfied. It gets everyone who dies. The grave is trying to absorb. That's what the enemy is trying to do. He's trying to take as many people to hell as he can because he knows his time is limited. He knows that the second coming of Jesus Christ is coming sooner than he'd like to think. And his run around the world is going to be over soon. And when I think about death, I think about the, the imagery of what death is. I think about the Grim Reaper. Anybody know who the Grim Reaper looks like? Like a black hood and the skull face and the scythe of the, of the sickle that comes to collect. And I was researching that. It says that the Grim Reaper was um, created in the 14th century when there was the bubonic plague in Europe, where a third of the population died. And it's this image of death coming. 
And most kids, especially when they're younger, they have a fear of the nighttime. When it gets dark in their room, they're fearful what might come out the closet or might, might grab them. Or they may have a fear of dying. But my Bible says you don't have to fear death because Jesus conquered it. Amen. When Jesus became sin and he was resurrected from the grave, before he was resurrected from the grave, he went to hell and took the keys of life and death from the enemy. He says, no longer will my people sit in the grave and wait. This goes back to a teaching that Elder Jim has shared. He said that, that when Jesus came out in, verse, in Matthew 27 and 53, it says when Jesus was arise, he said they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. So when Jesus arose, all the saints from old arose with him. And as Elder Jim mentioned, people were walking the streets. That people had like grandparents and, and, and saints and prophets and old were walking the streets of Jerusalem because Jesus was a sinner because he took back the keys of death. Amen. Death has no hold on you. We sing that song. Death has no hold on you. You are the risen king. So if you don't have to worry about the fear of death or the fear of the grave, then what are you worried about? If you know that if something does happen to you and that's tragic, then you're going to be with Jesus forever. You'll be in new bodies. So you don't lose. We cannot lose. So quit walking through life like you've already lost or that you're, you feel like the devil's winning. No, no, you've already won. That's a mindset and a perspective that we all need to have. Amen. Death should no longer be a source of fear for you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ because Jesus has overcome it. And through the shed blood of Christ, we have victory over death. We have victory over sin. In Hosea 13, 14, it says, I will ransom them for the power of the grave, death. I will. That means God says, I will ransom them. If you're a believer, he says, I got you. Don't matter what's going on in the world. Don't matter the calamity that's happened. Don't matter. I got you. Which leads me to the third and final point. We've talked about the victory of the sting of death, the victory over the grave. And my last point is this. We also have the victory over the strength of sin. In 1 Corinthians 15, 56 through 57, it says that the strength of sin is the law. We are not bound by the law that the saints of old in the Old Testament were. We are bound by grace. I'll be honest with you. This is maybe controversial to some of you, but I'm glad they've taken out the, the Ten Commandments out of the schools. Uh -huh. You know why? Because none of us can, can do the Ten Commandments without the power of God in us. Amen. So they're sending goals in our kids in the school systems on some goals they can never achieve. Amen. Independent of Jesus Christ. That's right. The law tells you what you can do. Thou shalt not. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. We are not bound by law. We are bound by grace, which means we want to honor the law. But we are subjugated to grace, which means when you don't honor the law, he gives you forgiveness if you ask for it. If you repent, Jesus, OK, I get it. Like I told Master, she lost that game. It was the grace of me that I let her ride home with me. <laughs> I'm a graceful father. Even though y'all lost. Come on, baby, I got you. And in fact, I took her. I got some ice cream because that was my grace. Right. But that's the grace of God that we have. We don't have to be confined by the law because we can't keep it anyways. The law is a powerful thing. And back in the Old Testament, the law would lead to death. You look at the Old Testament law and the Old Testament customs of the Jewish people. Man, they would stone you in a heartbeat. There's all kind of rules. The rules that even the, the preachers couldn't even keep in, in the Old Testament days. Uh -huh. There's so many laws. I can't do this. I can't do that. Can't do this. I can't do that. But God says through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, I've covered the law. I became sin. So you could not be subjugated by it or die by it. We owe Jesus everything. That's why I call this message Echoes of, Echoes of Easter, because we celebrate the message of Jesus once a year. But it should be a message we celebrate 365, 24, 7. All right. All right. The reason why we're here is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. We have eternal life because of what he did on the cross. Um, a good friend of mine, Brother Dante in the back. Raise your hand, Brother Dante. Good friend of mine sent me something powerful this morning. He said that. He says, picture this. Jesus looks at the cross and Jesus looks at you. Jesus says, you are worth it. Amen. Isn't that a powerful image? Yeah. Even though we know we're not worth it, but in his eyes we were and he did it anyways. I always think how powerful that is that he went to the cross. He knew what he had to do. He knew he had to become sin. The one who never knew sin had to become sin. 
Because he knew that was the only way that we would bridge the divide between God and us was the bridge as the cross. The blood that he shed is the bridge between us and Jesus, between us and the Lord. But we don't deserve that. We're about to go out this, this, the, four build, uh, the four walls of this building. We're going to start sinning. We don't deserve that, but he did it anyways. Amen. What a gracious God we have. Amen. What a God that, that loves us so much that he saves himself for people that are not worthy, yet he did it anyways. This is the message of the cross. It's not just for Easter, but it's every day. Because we're not worthy, but he is. And because our Lord and Savior bore the sin and took the keys of death, this is why we can boast confidently that we have the victory over sin. We have the victory over death. We have the victory over the grave. That's because of what we've done. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Life is much better than we give credit for. We have a chance. We have a new beginning. And if you messed up, repent and go about your business. Amen. You're saved by grace. Amen. Quit condemning yourselves. The world does enough job of that, but not you. Yeah. Quit condemning other ch church folk Amen. when they mess up. Pick Amen. them up. Well. Show them how to do it right. Yeah. Let's quit kicking people down. We've got enough of that. We got a lot of people criticizing other people in the church, too, and how they're doing things. And we're quick to criticize. Let's get over that. In 2 Timothy, Timothy 1 and 7, it says, For the spirit God gave does not make us fearful. But it gives us power, love, and a sound mind. You don't have to fear anything. If you feel fear, that is not God, I promise you. Amen. The only thing you should fear is the fear of God. Mm -hmm. But that's more of a reverence. Yes. He doesn't want you scared to come in his presence. He wants you to come boldly. But what it says is that I will respect you. I will bow down in front of you. I will honor your word. We're in tough times, people. But we have the victory in Jesus because he is one. And I open up this message talking about discouragement. And I want to give you two things about discouragement before I wrap up that should help you. Again, you're going to be inundated with more bad news. It's inevitable. And it's going to get closer. But how you respond to it is everything. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember that God will help you. We talked about the Holy Spirit is our counselor. He's our God. He's our comforter. The Holy Spirit will help you. Ask him in prayer. If you're scared or you're fearful or you don't know something, ask him for guidance and direction. He'll talk to you. He'll lead you. The second thing is this. Resist discouragement. It's easy to get discouraged. Discouraged is when your courage runs out. The enemy is constantly trying to take you because he knows if I can get you discouraged, that means I can get you from reading this. If I can get you from reading this, I can prevent you from coming to church. That's why it's important when you're going through things, don't. It always baffles me that people will stay away from church. But this is where your strength is. Amen. Because the enemy is not just fighting with you. He's fighting with all of us. Yes. If you're going through something, come to the church so we can help, so we can yeah. pray, so we can encourage you. Yeah. Yeah. The enemy knows if I can get you away from the flock, then I can have my way with you anyway. I can say any old thing. Uh -huh. It's hard to offend somebody when you're surrounded by the enemy. Yeah. But when you're in here, we surround the enemy. Yeah. And it's, he can't fight all of us. Uh -huh. But you got to come. You got to risk discouragement. You got to fight back. Discouragement is a choice. If you feel discouraged, it's because you have allowed yourself to feel that way. No one is forcing yourself to feel bad. But I would encourage you, if you have some issues, maybe it's time to turn off the TV for a little bit. Maybe it's time to get off of social media for a little bit. Maybe it's time to get rid of those negative friends in your circle that keep pulling you down when you try to come up. Maybe it's time for you to change some things in your life. If you're around people that are pulling energy from you, hmm. You might want to rethink that relationship. Again, people are going to be looking to you for answers because you represent the church. You're the light. In your workplace, in school, wherever it is that you go, people will know there's something different about you. And when they keep asking, where is God in all this? You have an answer. We have the victory as a believer. Amen. We've already won. Don't. So as our believers, we, we can't react to the world's issues like the world does. Because right. you're saying that I don't believe that Jesus Christ gives me the victory. Uh -huh. So you should stand firm. Yeah. This is going to yeah. be all right. You're going to be all right. Somebody gets a bad negative report in your workplace. And let's pray about it. That's an opportunity to witness and to worship. Amen. Amen. So again, death couldn't hold him down. He's the risen king. 
And as the last days are coming, you have to you know the term focus is a key word in your life. Focus. I saw this quote. It says that whatever you focus on will magnify in your life. Uh-huh. If you're fi- constantly focused on negative things, the negative things will magnify in your life. Uh-huh. If you're constantly focused on what's going wrong and what you don't have, you will constantly think about you're in a, a period of lack. But if I think about I have Jesus, I have victory. I think about the things that I have already. Then your perspective changes. You won't be discouraged. You will be encouraged. Yes. It's hard, hard to discourage, uh, uh, offer encouragement to somebody when you're down and trodden your own self. Well. There's a saying that says, fake it till you make it. But sometimes you just can't do that. Know that you've won. Act like you've won. Act like that you've got the victory. Act like you know something that they don't. And they need to find out for themselves. Amen. So don't focus on the sin around you. Rather, focus on the Savior that's in front of you. Amen. He's already paid the price. We just have to receive him. Amen? Amen. So let's offer a word of prayer as we close out, as we thank the Lord. Lord, we thank you, Father God. As the scripture says, but thanks be to God. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for waking us up. We thank you that you have the victory over sin and death. You thank you that you have the victory over the grave. We have nothing to fear. But we thank you, Father God, that we are victorious. We thank you, Father God, that we are saved by your grace and your mercy. We thank you, that Father God, that, that nobody can do us like you, Jesus. That all of the calamities happening in the world, that you will keep us safe. That, Lord, that if we do perish, it's not the end, but it's just the beginning. And we thank you, Father God. We thank you for those saints that have fallen that have gone to be on with you. We thank you for the race they have run. And we thank you, Lord, we have more work to do. We have more souls to save. And we thank you to give us courage and insight. We thank you as more shootings are on TV, that we pray for those individuals, that we, we comfort our, our neighbors, our friends, and our loved ones that are scared. We tell them, don't be scared. Jesus has already won the victory. Yes. And Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you give us encouragement in the face of discouragement. You give us encouragement, Father God. You give us peace. And we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And everyone said, amen. 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 Give the Lord a clap of hand. Amen. amen.